Hello? Hello! Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I just wanted to get up very quickly. Uh, we're going to run through the three of us. Uh, we put this event together with two others, uh, Phil Bell and Hoagie. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit about what it is and why we've done it. About a year ago, we... Um, yes? Sorry, my name is Harry. This is uh, Rebecca and... Um, what's Max. Name? Max. <laughs> They're going to introduce themselves in a minute. But um, we started this event about a year ago because a friend of mine said to me, oh, why don't we bring together all the student journalists? There's nothing that does that. And so we had an event in April with John Witheroni and Katz and so forth. And it went well enough that we thought, well, why don't we just bring lots of different people together that are interested in journalism? And Max and Rebecca stumbled upon the idea of bringing people doing new media, and they're going to tell you a bit more about that. So I just wanted to give you an introduction and pass you on. Okay, yeah, thanks everyone for um, coming. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, just to let you know, I'm going to be as brief as possible because we've got so many great speakers. Uh, we don't want to run into our time. So basically, um, I'll just let you know how tonight's going to work. We have uh, our data panel, uh, which is you know, full of some of the most exciting journalists working in the media today, um, which will start shortly. Um, and after this panel finishes, um, we'll be going downstairs for food and drinks. And um, just, I, I would say, take this opportunity to really just talk to as many people as you can. So we've got some fantastic journalists um, in attendance tonight, as well as some um, lots of aspiring journalists as well. So um, yeah, really just make the most of it. Um, after food and drinks, uh, there'll be the editors panel. Um, again, with some really, really great speakers. Really looking forward to it. And then everyone's uh, welcome to hang around afterwards, have a few drinks at the bar and join us. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's great to have you. Hello, is this working? Everyone hear me? Hello everyone, my name's Conrad Quilty Harper. Um, I'm a, uh, a reporter at the newly launched data journalism website Amped, you might have heard of. Um, previously I was at the Telegraph for a few years and uh, Max invited me here to kind of moderate the panel and uh, kind of guide the, uh, the panellists through a debate about um, data journalism. And normally these things are, are called kind of a future of journalism, um, it's, it's a buzzword. But I mean, really, it's been going for a long time, even as a kind of new thing. It's, I mean, I, I, I got my first job in data journalism about four years ago at The Telegraph. Um, but it's not a new thing, data journalism. It's just that people happen to be getting jobs called data journalist, journalists. Um, so what I wanted to do is just in, introduce the whole panel. Um, so to my left here, I have Mona, Mona Chalabi, um, who is a data journalist at The Guardian. Um, and she is joining uh, Nate Silver's uh, new startup at, AB, at ESPN, um, 5.38 in December. Um, and uh, Mona, Mona is working at the moment on the Guardian's data blog, um, which is one of the industry leading kind of uh, uh, things for data journalism, um, I, I think. Um, we also have Daniel Knowles, um, who's a reporter at The Economist. Um, Daniel Knowles writes on social affairs and the changing face of Britain for The Economist. Um, he also... Yep, there we go. And we, he, was also, <laughs> he was also a former colleague of mine at The Telegraph, and he's also written for Spectator, City AM. Um, and BuzzFeed. We'll, and BuzzFeed. There we go. That's, is, that, is that your most proud? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's up there with The Economist. <laughs> we also have Nicola Hughes, who's a data journalist and developer at The Times and The Sunday Times. Um, and uh, Nicola was a Knight Fellow as well. The Guardian, and you also uh, do training, uh, you go around the world and train different groups of people in data techniques, and, and, and I've, I've been to a couple of Nicholas sessions, they're absolutely brilliant. Um, also, also at Scraper Wiki. And um, for last but not least, we have Michael Blasland, who is a writer and broadcaster, and co-author of The Tiger That Isn't, which was one of my course reading materials at City. Um, brilliant book about statistics in the news. Um, he's also the creator of the BBC4 radio program, more or less. Um, and uh, it's great to have the whole panel here. Um, so t I just want to kick off the panel. Um, today we've had quite a data-heavy day, really. I mean, there's been crime statistics out. There's been um, a, a National Audit Office uh, report looking at the accuracy of waiting times data in the NHS. You've also had um, uh, school lead tables data. Um, 
And a lot of that has kind of focused on the accuracy or lack of accuracy in that data. Um, so I just wanted to ask Michael to kick us off. Um, your book, you know, uh, in your book you have examples from tw 15, 20 years ago, if not longer, about how badly statistics is presented um, in, you know, in various different areas like crime and, and hospitals. Has, have things changed? Have they got better? Have they got better? Has the journalism got better, or have has the origin of the data got better, <laughs> or both? I think both. Yes, both. Has the origin of the, the origin of the data does get better? I think. I mean, we have a lot more people watching it for a start. So, people like the Statistics Authority, um, you know, I mean, they have just taken away the designation for police crime recorded statistics. That's no longer a national statistic, and they've said that because they lack confidence in the the way that the police are recording the numbers. Um, you know, they used to be, uh, the Audit Commission used to be watching them do that. The Audit Commission isn't around in the same, much of the Audit mm -hmm. Commission left anymore. So that hasn't happened. And they've departed from the Crime Survey. But the Crime Survey is still there. And the Crime Survey is still, I mean, they're all still there. The Crime Survey is still there with a badge, a little green tick from the National Statistics. Uh, and it's pretty good, I think. You know, there are problems with surveys. You can't survey murdered people, for example. <laughs> um, you, uh, you know, there have been various adjustments about taking in crime for under 16s and so on. But bit by bit, I think we do get better at these things. I mean, the edu education is interesting as well, uh, because there have been about, there have been, what, four or five huge revisions of the way that we do league tables. I mean, we had pure GCSEs, five GCSEs, A to C. Then they had to include English and maths. Then we had value added. Then we had contextual value added. Then we got rid of contextual value added, more or less. And now at A-level, we've got vocational and non-vocational league tables. And at every turn, there have been some schools that have leapt up or disappeared off the bottom. You know, there have been radical revisions for some schools mm -hmm. in each of those adjustments. And I think people le legitimately say, you told me that was good. And now you're telling me that was bad. But another way of looking at it was just to say they, these are different cuts of the data. Yeah. I mean, they all tell you things. They all tell you, know, and, and they're all quite interesting things. Uh, it's just that they're different cuts of the data. And the sort of impatience that says, no, I want one number that's going to tell me whether my child will be well educated. Well, come on. <laughs> come on. You know, there's no pat answer to whether your child will be well educated. There's no single pat number that's going to tell you whether your operation will be a success. You know, the, it's, it's harder than that. Mm -hmm. It is just harder than that. And not because people are lying. <coughs> not necessarily because, I mean, sometimes because people are lying, but not necessarily. It's just because there's huge amounts of uncertainty in recording numbers. There's great difficulty in interpretation numbers that go up and down all the time. You know, the variability. Uh, yeah. you know, there's a great deal of chance and uncertainty in a lot of data. So you have to work at it. I think that's, that's how I feel. <laughs> and uh, people do. You know, those revisions are legitimate attempts to try and get the best handle, given what people seem to want. And I think that's no, that's no, you could look at it as a kind of shifting the boundaries if you want. I think of, I look at it as a way of trying to get the thing right. And it's definitely a developing thing, isn't it? It's not something that you can't ever consist, say we've reached a point where now we've, everything's happy and we don't need to worry about no, the quality no, of data. I, no, and, and that's always, uh, I mean, it's a problem in a way with uh, some of the things that are said about big data. You think if your sample's big enough, you have some kind of permanent answer. You don't, because you have things like recessions coming along. And, uh, y you know, in recessions, the targets get tougher, and the money gets shorter, and the behavior changes. And so you look at hospitals again and again every time, and you find different responses to the targets. And you find that the gaming has moved a little bit, and these kind of things. So you're perpetually on the watch for yeah. the sort of ways in which the data is being manipulated or adjusted or whatever. We can't rest, no, alas. I wonder if I can ask the rest of the panel kind of if they have some examples of how they've grappled with that in their work about the quality of data and, and kind of the, the, the kind of confidence you can say something about a data set. Yeah. I think yeah. what a data journalist really brings to the newsroom is the way someone knows their beat of, I don't think this person is telling the truth, I think there's an agenda. And a data person should be able to see whether the numbers are telling the truth or has an mm. agenda. It's about really understanding about the integrity more than anything else. And um, I gave a talk at like South by Southwest a couple of years ago, and it was basically about what big data is, it allows you to be wrong with infinite precision. <laughs> and what they want, 
this is the thing. They think that if something is precise, it is true, and that you've done your work. You can do all your work and get it completely wrong just because there's enough to back it up that has been interpreted incorrectly from the beginning. Um, and so what, a, what lacks a lot in journalism <coughs> is any information on the integrity of the data before you report it on it. Mm -hmm. And the uh, example I give, because it's one of the most well-known examples, is the Iraq war logs. And a big deal was made about the numbers of civilian deaths. And how many people here know that in the Iraq war logs, the year that they gave, there's an entire month missing? <laughs> Did anyone actually look at the data? It was put out, it was put out on The Guardian, but it was in no way written that the month of August was completely gone. The Bradley Manning, when he transferred it, that data got corrupted, and it is missing. So all the numbers were given, and the numbers were touted, and it was this big data release. Yeah. But it really was, did you look through this? Did you see whether it was all there? I just took a look at it, individually going through the file, um, sure. to look actually for analysis and discrepancies. I wanted to look for the large numbers that stood out. And there was one that was 250, was not confirmed, and looked to be like a mass grave. But that was not in the news or anything like and it's that. It's not just, I mean, obviously, everyone can make mistakes with this kind of stuff, can't they? Um. An analysis yeah. piece, just like before you actually write about quoting someone, you interview them and you take your notes and you go through your notes. It's the exact same thing, which is why, to a certain extent, my style of data journalism is very much computer driven so that I have a record of absolutely everything that has been done. I don't trust things being done by hand because when you redo them you'll get a different answer because there's always slip ups. At least if I do it programmatically I can give people exactly what I've done. So it's almost like they a scientific approach to journalism yeah. in a way. Well, not scientific. What I say and what I learned from my experience at The Guardian is I I'm coming from computer programming from a journalism point of view, and I want to say, what happens if I'm being brought to court over this? Because I'm yeah. going to do data-driven journalism into bank accounts, into spending, into offshore money. You will be dealing with businesses that do not want the bad PR. And a lot of the times what they do is they threaten, and they go straight to your editor, and they say, we really don't like this. We want you to show us all, the, all your workings. And if you've had... 10 people at it for six months, you cannot afford yeah. to redo it again or to actually show them everything that you've done if you've just got a massive pile of paper and 15 people working on it. I show them my program, I tell them, I give them the environment, I say, find someone who runs your website to run this, and they usually back off. I think you're, you're unique in the, uh, if that's, that's the process, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm really in awe. <laughs> um, can I ask Dan if you've had any kind of, I mean obviously you work with kind of official statistics that are coming out and, and you're kind of interpreting them and turning them yes. into stories. What challenges have you found dealing with that? I mean there are certainly the challenges of knowing what data to trust and how to interpret it and, and there's the challenges of sort of what people, I mean a lot of it's just debunking what you're told, you know, and you sort of, you actually, you're told a statistic and you look it up and sort of knowing what's relevant. But um, I mean for example, but, um, one thing that's quite interesting, you mentioned the crime statistics, and, and um, there's this big issue, you know, if you're reporting on crime, well, you have recorded crime statistics which are very detailed and, and, and give you local level data, and then you have um, overall, sorry, crime survey statistics which, which are wonderful and you can trust them, but they don't give you the data. And so when you're trying to, you know, look at, I'm doing, writing about sort of local crime trends, so you want to look at where crime's gone up and where crime's gone down, you've sort of making a judgment as to what statistics. So my sort of general rule is that you can roughly trust uh, recorded crime statistics on burglaries, murders, and uh, car thefts, because people report a burglary, they'll report a uh, car theft because they need their insurance, and a murder, well, it tends to be that murders are recorded. You can't hide a body. Yeah, there's a body or there is a body. A body. Um, <laughs> um, and mostly when people go missing, somebody eventually notices. Um, so, so you can kind of trust those, but of course, yeah, you, know, you have the issues of you. Want, you want to say, well, this is what's been happening with fraud or with um, um, sexual offences or those sort of things, and you just you can't. Um, so those are the sort of issues I, I guess I encounter. Um, I mean, mostly it's just a sort of like, how do you get past the, um, you know, the sort of the headline statistic and just digging through spreadsheets to find something interesting and find a trend that nobody spotted and and. And you have to self-police and you know, make sure that something that looks brilliant and gives you a fantastic statistic isn't actually a blip or something within the margin of error. And it can be very tempting as a journalist to 
come up with some utterly brilliant statistic <laughs> that you know that, that sort of illustrates your your point perfectly. Um, except, of course, that it's probably bollocks. Um, and yeah, you know, because it's it, there's a margin of error, a sampling error. It's a small uh, sample, or or you're looking at a weird period. So. Um, so yeah. I can give two examples involving crime. Yeah. So a lot of police forces are very different, covered very different areas. So the way they produce statistics are normalized to a percentage. So one of the things was the amount of times they fired or used a taser. Mm -hmm. And clearly, you can't compare the n exact numbers because the police forces are quite different, different size, cover a different mm -hmm. area. So they did a percentage sort of change. But the problem is, is you get a small force that used a taser once and then used two the next year, it's gone up 50% and you compare it with a force like Manchester that did 200 yeah. times to 400 times and all of a sudden they rank the same mm. and you, yeah. just, you just cannot do that. You have, you have to see if it's normalized, yeah. you have to compare like by like general figures. Another one I was looking at was um, sexual crimes, um, uh, sexual offenses and I saw a very small town in Cambridge had gone up 300% from the year mm. and I was like, it's probably a horrible sex offender out there that no one's actually gone and looked for. Yeah. But then I realized, I googled, you know, what happened in this town, anything this year involving sexual offenses. And in the year between these two figures, a, a, a center had opened up for people who have been, who have sexual offenders, to go and seek help. And therefore, it's not the number of sexual offenses, it's the rate of be being reported. So it's like it's, it probably hasn't changed that much. It's just more people are reporting it, and that has made the change. So there's a lot of, I mean, interrogating the data is really a very intrinsically yeah. journalistic activity. You're checking, yeah. verifying, finding out whether it's true, essentially. Um, I don't well, want to put I just my stand up for it, though, course, as a constructive yeah. activity, because sure. I think you know it's, it's very easy to fall into the habit of thinking that what that our business is knocking stuff down, mm. and we're trying to find out. Mm. And that's, uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of squirreling away into these things. So was it, give me mm. one great little example uh, uh, on the murder statistics. Um, because one of the reservations about those is, are we just treating people better? Are we patching them up in hospital? Mm. <laughs> so we're still stabbing and shooting them as often as we ever were. It's just that we're repairing the damage better yeah. than they don't die. Definitely in, uh, you know, so it's not murder yeah. anymore. Yeah. So there was um, a briefing on the crime statistics, and one of the... One of the ONS people. Now, this, this, is, this is where I promise you it's getting better. Because they they you know, they're, they're coming out of, the, out of the closets, the ONS people now, and they're talking directly to the yeah. media. Uh, they didn't used to do this. They felt that comment was um, kind of forbidden. But they're doing it now. And the guy said, well, you can test that. You can check the attempted murders. Yeah. And, a good if, one they're, with and if they're crime, following the same well. trend, yeah. then the murders are probably right. And you think, that's interesting. And you kind of make that little bit of progress. And so, the, so the, that's why I say it's constructive. Yeah. You, know, you learn something about... The, and these people, they, they know where all the skeletons are. <laughs> you know, they're, they're very smart. They've done the surveys mm. themselves. They've got the data. They know these kind of answers. And they are coming out. And we are making that kind of progress, I think. Mm. It's slow and laborious, and there are a lot of backward steps. And I, you know, I've spent half my career picking on the bad stuff. But I do think there are reasons mm. to be... I was, I was going to say to Mona, um, so before the session, um, you, you told me you don't consider yourself to be a journalist. Um, why, do you, why do you think that? I mean, you produce you know, brilliant stories that I consider to be journalistic on the, at the Guardian Data Blog. What do you consider yourself to be in terms of a category of job? Can I address the first point really quickly? Chris? Sure, yeah, go for so it. So the first point, I think basically what we're talking about is an asymmetry of information, right? That we tend to get these releases like 40, 50 a day sometimes from the ONS, and sometimes we just take them at ta face value and we kind of just report them back to you. And you're saying, how do you kind of go one mm. step further than that? And one of the things that really interests me in terms of what we've been discussing so far is that no one's really mentioned the role of the reader. And the reader is absolutely critical, as far as I'm concerned, in what we do. So the asymmetry of information, if you take the two releases that you mentioned today, the crime survey and the school's league tables are totally different because in the crime survey, everyone, everyone in any piece, right, your first question is where's me? So you're going to look up crime perhaps in where you live. And if you see that there's been 50 burglaries, you might think kind of anecdotally, oh, okay, that might not seem right or that seems about right, but it's actually really, really difficult for you to judge. Whereas with the school's league tables, that, that asymmetry is fundamentally different because I'll get an, an email in my inbox straight away from a headmistress or a headmaster in a school being like, actually, you've said 154 pupils in, in our school got A star to C and actually it was 200 
who got A star to C. And those kind of checks and balances are slightly different. Mm. Um, so for us, actually, what happens below the line is really, really intrinsic in terms of us finding stories and stuff. Because when people are doing that activity of where's me, they'll go to one single cell in a spreadsheet and say, this doesn't seem right. And maybe they're, maybe they're a healthcare professional in a hospital about that cell or something. <laughs> and they can just, it's quite, it goes back to like this link between traditional journalism. Like they provide us with the backstory of the why. Because so much of what we do is just describing what. Mm. And if you don't go to the why, then actually you just mm. kind of become these kind of like, almost like an extension of government because yeah. you're just explaining by describing and what we need to do is go one foot step this is, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I mean, I have a real problem with the term data journalism. I mean, at The Economist um, and also at some places like the FT, I mean, the idea that, you know, we, I mean, we do have a data editor, but everybody's a data journalist and nobody is. I mean, essentially, okay. everybody should be able to interrogate data or else you're not doing your job properly. And you go back into our research department, well, we've got books and books and books of data from back from the era when you couldn't just download ONS releases. I mean, sometimes we have to go back to them because the ONS government doesn't publish everything um, that they've got. Quite a lot of data, you know, going back sort of pre-1970s, for example, just isn't there, but it's in these books. And um, kind of, I mean... I, it, yeah, I think the Guardian is very interesting in the way of getting people below the line to country. We're still quite traditional, but you know, but when we're unsure about data or when you know, you have to combine it with interviews. It's not enough to have a spreadsheet and go, "Oh, this is really interesting," or "Look at this increase." You know, you have to sort of go think. You, you start with someone? a spreadsheet, but then once you've done the spreadsheet, you go and visit somewhere, or and you interview people, and then you write a story. Um, it's it's not just a sort of like here's the latest release and here's some striking stats. Um, yeah, what I think is really yeah. obvious from this panel is, like you said, everyone's a data journalist and no mm. one's a data journalist. We all do really different things. So I don't work off press releases. Mm. Um, I have people that will and they will come to us and we will double check things and we will uh, help around. But I, will, I see myself as very much investigative. So I was telling mm. Michael that what I see myself is, is when I, a website for me is a crime scene. I will see that something, I can look at it and tell you something not right happened here. <laughs> I will go in, I will find the clues, and I'll try and figure out what happened to get it like this. Um, and I will construct databases out of things that haven't been released. Or we will just use FOIs and combine it with things. And mm -hmm. I think that's actually really quite strong. And of course they say like big data and semantic data. When you're combining two sets and each one you have to do a lot of data integrity, mm -hmm. putting them together is just absolutely horrendous. But what I say for, the way to explain what I do or what can be done is I tell the j journalists because they don't know what an API is and they really, for me, I'm something what really, really different in the newsroom, is I say, <laughs> what, imagine what you could do if you had an infinite number of interns that were, but you, an infinite number of interns. I like that as a metric like, for work in exactly. a newspaper. <laughs> but you actually, you have to manage them. You have to tell them what to do and anything goes mm. wrong, it's the way you've told them how to do it. They can't, like, you can't, t like, when I say an infinite intern, an in intern could see a table and know what you mean by saying, I only want these types of people. But a really, really, like, an intern that, that English is not their first language, where you actually <laughs> have to sit down and spell things out for them. And so I can run an investigative bureau out of, all these things, and then completely just and not have to pay them or feed them. Just on the po on the below the line. Nicholas talking about computer. Not we don't do this with people. <laughs> on the below the below the line feedback uh, point. I mean, there's a, a good rule of thumb. It's just to say where you're getting where you're getting stories. Check it with the aggregate data. Where you're getting aggregate yeah. data. Check it with the stories, mm. because the stories give you the qualitative sense of how the data was generated in the first place and the kind of real experience mm. so you find the person who says you know what we were supposed to code it like this but we don't because you know mm. and th that's that's suddenly you've got a the, the whole thing opens up so and, the, uh, the intrinsic i'm trying to get at here is like there's an intrinsic activity that we all do in our jobs that's not really you know it's you don't necessarily have to be a journalist you don't necessarily have to be you know uh, an academic or something like that but there's a, a tr intrinsic skill which is common sense checking and digging and and kind of feed, constant feedback loop of, of looking at data and I, and I have one more thing to it it's it's resisting confirmation bias yeah mm. this is i mean there's this can you explain can you define well, that for there's this, there's this phrase you grew up with in journalism that you go out and you stand up the story and there's a subtle difference between standing up the story and seeing if the story stands up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The problem is that as soon as you have the idea of the story in your head, it affects the way that you interpret every piece of data. 
So you're going so, to so, find so, that so, story. So a, yeah. a, a little, little analog I sometimes use. If you're, if you're watching uh, uh, Casualty on TV and somebody coughs, you know that's not, not a statistically significant event, but you're watching Casualty, right? So you know it's going to be a triple heart bypass. That's just, a, that's just the way <laughs> Casualty works. That's an old John Sargent joke, by the way. Um, but that, happen, that happens to the way that we approach news. Once you lodge in your idea and the news editor mm. sits there and has a, says, I sense recovery in the air, you know, and then sends you out to go and find some. You'll find yeah, yeah, some. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You'll find yeah, some. Exactly. Because you're predisposed to accept yeah. certain kinds of evidence and dismiss other kinds of evidence. And one of the things I think data, data journalism or sort of an awareness of data gradually does to you, it strips out your presumptions. Because you're just going in there to find out. And it, you know, it's a kind of, that's, that's the sort of purity I think about the, the, the job. Yeah. It, it, it does. You know, any, any, any confirmation bias, you think, oh, I wonder, I just wonder, I wonder what's in there. Mm. Mm. And, it, and for me, at least, I think it's, it's kind of made me more open-minded about doing a proper journalistic job rather than what I used to think I used to do was just go out and stand up stories. And coming, so coming back to Mona then, so <laughs> you say you're not a journalist. What's, what are you then? Maybe I was just drunk when I said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know how I'd describe it. My role. I just can you I, go, can you go back to um, your kind of start in this field and what where did you start and how did you end up where you are and how how did you end up going to five thirty eight What's the perhaps the frontline club is not the right place to say this. I think it's because I don't necessarily see the term journalist as something that's like all good if you're not over <laughs> here and maybe that's why I kind of like I think. Um, I think part of the reason why I got into data journalism is because I saw it as an opportunity to not write in a specific style that's quite alienating. So I work at The Guardian. I think it is an absolutely fantastic, fantastic newspaper. Um, and I'm leaving this. I'm no longer in, like, obliged to say it. I really do. Um, and no one that I love or care about in my social life ever reads it. And I think that's <laughs> such a massive problem. And I saw data journalism as kind of a way to communicate stuff in a slightly different way to the kind of political reporting, which is citing examples that most people, like, you know, happened before we were born or, or are from like really, really niche things where you're used to having these conversations with people that understand it. So I think that's maybe one of the reasons why I'm not that inclined to describe myself as a journalist. Um, and in terms of how I got into it, um, I didn't get into I think a lot of data journalists were previously journalists who kind of made the shift towards data journalism. And I'd always worked with data, um, either through like NGOs or think tanks, or um, I worked at a bank file. Um, so I'd always worked with data and I was always frustrated by my inability to kind of communicate it. Um, and so data journalism just seemed like quite <laughs> a sensible route. Yeah. Can I ask Dan the same question? Um, so what's your, you started, where did you discover data? Did you always I know that know. data was something that was interesting to you? And, or? Um, I, I mean, I guess it began with um, the statistics class I had to take for my degree, um, which I hated and didn't see the point of. Um, and it was only later that you basically, you know, I, so I was, uh, I started at City AM, and that, but um, when I joined the Telegraph, I was working, uh, writing politics stories mostly. And, um, and every morning I got up incredibly early and read all of the newspapers. And it, it used to strike me how often there were stories that were just clearly rubbish. Um, <laughs> in kind of every paper, every paper would have stories that were based on you know, either whether it would be a, a poll that was self-selecting, uh, a sort of things that, that just weren't true. And, and it began getting to me, and I began getting quite pernickety about it. And then um, when I joined The Economist, I mean, my job at The Economist is not really, it's not a data journalism job, it's just a, it's a job that is, because I'm mostly covering social affairs, tends to rely a lot on national statistics and on survey data so it kind of does rely a lot on data but um, and yeah it just kind of carried on questioning and thinking about actually what is true and, and I've become an obsessive about sort of you know knocking down myths about British society and, and those sorts of things and, and um, yeah I think there's a real kind of problem in British journalism of uh, journalism generally actually of taking data at face value quite often and surveys and statistics which don't mean anything and um, just reporting and also making assumptions that are actually quite easy to check. I mean, the number of times you'll see a columnist say, well, of course, this is, this is going up and it's just not. And it would take you a matter of 10 minutes if you knew where you, what you were doing to, to mm -hmm. look up on 
the ONS uh, or whatever. So, you know, a stat that will give you a sense of, of actually what is going on. And so that's kind of where I come into it. Can I ask Michael, were you always interested in maths and, and numbers? No, I was an aesthete. <laughs> yeah, I did English at university. I was going to discover the world through poetry, and that was, that was my <laughs> truth. Um, and I still do, you know. Uh, but um, there is this kind of other, you know, I now have the complete collection of pens for my top pocket as well. So uh, I, it, was, it was really working with Andrew Dillnot, I think. You know, I spent a, lot, a, a long time working with Andrew, making programs for analysis and then making more or less. And there's a great pleasure. I mean, part, partly, the, partly it was because I felt entitled to ask damn fool questions. You know, I had no claim, no pretense to knowing anything whatsoever about any, and then you, and you can say, you know, someone like Andrew, you can say, so um, <laughs> growth, <laughs> what grows? How do we know that? Are we do a survey, who do we survey? How, how, how? So what, what, they, what they still fill it in, in print, <laughs> they do. 1.7 million forms every year. They still do it in print. Can you believe that? The business world. Um, yeah, they, they send out servers. They send them back. You know, how, how often? And how many? And, you know, and you, know, and you just kind of... And, and suddenly the world just seemed full of possibilities for your curiosity. You know, so these received things. You, know, so you feel entitled to ask all these stupid mm -hmm. questions, which actually, I mean, you know, they're not so stupid. A lot of people who are producing the data sometimes don't ask themselves the qualitative questions about yeah. the, the provenance and so on. So that was, that was how it began. And with a particular question, actually, I can, re I can remember tests for joining the European Union. Does yeah. anybody remember that? Gordon Brown's five tests. He said five tests will only join the monetary union. Monetary union, if. And there are these five tests. And you could measure them all. <laughs> and there was one test that you couldn't really measure, which was labour mobility. It's very hard to get a handle on that. So we weren't going to bother. But labour mobility is arguably the most important test of about whether a monetary union is going to work or not, because you need some kind of adjustment between countries. So we decided we'd measure the things that we could measure, and we'd leave aside the thing that we couldn't measure, even though it's probably the most important thing to measure. And you think, that's quite an interesting way of conducting policy. And, you know, and so that, that, was, that was one that really sort of set us off. That's a huge problem with politics, isn't it? Um, just sort of chasing targets because it's the one thing that you can actually measure. Yeah. You can and, count and it, so let's yeah. count it. Yeah. Um, and the Lucas critique, of course, applies to everything. Mm. Um, like the moment, the moment politicians identify a relationship between two variables and data and It'll begin trying wrong. to change it, that's when it stops working. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. uh, can I ask uh, the panel what, what you think is the future in terms of both kind of uh, the, the jobs in journalism, in d doing data, um, and also kind of the, the prospects for doing better journalism in terms of the data that's available to us. Um, some of the things that we've, that I've been thinking about, you know, the census is potentially going to end. Um, uh, down this morning you were tweeting about um, selling uh, land uh, yeah. statistics. Uh, the land, land price statistics are, might, be, uh, might be stopped, is it? Is that, is that, is that yeah, right? well, they've already stopped... Um, Statistics. Yeah. The value office no longer collates statistics on on land values, yeah. which is completely ridiculous because the government's new planning system is supposed to incorporate land values as a sort of measure of demand in in whether or not your you know council should be uh, releasing more land or not. So um, so it's madness. So they they've introduced a system which depends on statistics, which they've simultaneously abolished. Um, and there's there's other things. There's the Met Office. There's loads, the Met yeah. Office might be sold. The Land Registry might be sold. Ordnance Survey. The, already had the Post the, Office sold. There's there's an entire government scandal that's been, I think, underreported um, on how this government's treated statistics. Um, because on one side they've been quite good. They've made access to them quite open. But on the other hand, they're just busy slashing series that yeah. were really useful, you know, survey, the DFE slash several surveys, the um, um, DCLG, Department of Communities, the government's the worst, I think they pretty much got rid of their entire research budget, um, and including several statistical series, it's just... Muna, do you think going to the US you're going to be living in a wondrous land where lots of, there's a lot more data there, I mean Justin Bieber got arrested this morning and half an hour later we had the arrest report, Is, are you looking forward to uh, kind of the, the land of... <laughs> 
open data in, in, in America? I'm not sure it is the land of open data. I think FOIs are quite a powerful tool. Um, and I think sometimes you need to you need to have that kind of reflex to ask the right questions and not to, to not necessarily kind of assume that you're going to be getting the right data on a specific website that's released by government. Are you optimistic about the future in terms of data journalism and and uh, and where it's going? I mean, is it going to grow? Are we at peak <coughs> data journalism now? Or, you know, are editors is this the, the the kind of the size of the kind of clique? Or is it going to grow bigger? Will we have every journalist? learning about data as a, as a core thing, like, like shorthand? I, I think it's going to grow. I think it's going to need to balance two trends that I don't think are conflicting, but it, it could kind of interpret as conflicting. And they're the growth of like the importance of proper statistical analysis, like really, really hardy stuff, not just being able to, as I said, kind of describe stuff, but being able to forecast, being able to drill deep and kind of really observe patterns, and also being able to just write well, and not write everything as like a percentage increase and a percentage fall, but to write in a way that's kind of compelling and engaging for people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's quite a difficult skill set to manage, and I think data journalism teams kind of need to shift so that you have like, you know, if you need to have a quant person on the team who just knows their statistics inside out, and you need to have an editor who has that eye for writing in a way that doesn't yeah. alienate people, then so be it. <laughs> yeah, so we have a, uh, a doctor in statistics on our team and uh, we're very lucky because uh, with my background as well I can work with him on his level but when we say whenever we ask him for an email he produces a thesis. It's like mm -hmm. not a thesis and whenever we're brainstorming or doing an investigation he's just like oh let me check the journal papers and I'm like no journal papers, no <laughs> journal papers, we have to get this out. Um, and I think what you need is you need more data journalism team that can deal with the raw ingredients yeah. and not wait for a press release or the end result yeah. statistics. Because what they're doing now is the reason why they're slashing down on yeah. those things is that they're very uh, people intensive and so that costs a lot of money. <laughs> what they're doing now is they're releasing the data raw and they're saying we've done what we said we do, we're not hiding anything, yeah. they're releasing it. So it's not that the problem previously in journalism was access to the data, now it's too much data. Now there is, it's, it, can we handle all of the amount that's coming up that isn't going to be nicely wrapped into a press release for us? Um, yes. And that's going yeah. to be the main thing, is being able to handle volumes, do the integrity checking, and do the analysis yourself at a level which they're not going to supply. And it's probably better, because then you have to do the checks and balances and the gathering yourself. You learn more about how it's actually done. I'm going to open it up to the floor now, because we've got 15 or so minutes left. Sure. Um, Anyone got any questions? Conrad, sorry, can we just, we forgot to announce the start of the hashtag for the event. <laughs> 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 but lay down. It's definitely new media, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, FDJ, which is a very short one called the future free show. FBJ. Testing. Oh, it works. Can you announce, say who you are and, and what? Oh, uh, I'm Ollie Franklin. Yeah. I work at GQ. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I want to touch on what you finished on there, which is presentation and storytelling and, you know, it's new media, so Twitter and the internet. Um, one of my favorite things that went around on Twitter this week was a chart showing the rise of the word, of the phrase, in one chart, in one chart. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else saw this. Was it going up? Uh, astronomically within like, the last 12 months, yeah. Um, and so I wanted to raise that, you know, Twitter is very chart friendly, as is certain forms of, you know, Upworthy and all these kind of new media things. So, uh, what does that present to you as challenges in terms of storytelling? Can I send that to Dan first? But yeah, being absolutely. The BuzzFeed yeah, so here's the thing. So, I've been, I, you know, my job is the Economist. We primarily we write in print, um, and, but I've been moonlighting recently <laughs> for BuzzFeed, and the it's quite it's quite interesting been doing it because. We, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at spreadsheets and looking at data and coming up with interesting things. Because ultimately, you maybe get one at best two charts because you've got to squeeze it into a print publication. So you spend a lot of time over those charts thinking, how can we squeeze information into this? Um, and then you try and pick the stats that best illustrate your case and the stats that sort of, you know, that are most interesting to put in the text while you're telling a story in between your interviews and quotes and the rest of it. And with BuzzFeed, well, it's kind of similar, but you can just tell the story in, you know, with an awful lot more data. You can say, here's the thing, and here's a chart which shows you it, and then here's the next thing. And it's break it up with pictures. And, and, um, and you have to think about kind of, you know, here, what's a really striking chart, but actually how does this chart connect to the next chart, which I'm showing, just because the kind of the freedom of the internet is that you have an unlimited amount of space. And, and uh, not, you know, you don't want to write anything, but 
you can you can have this sort of story told through visually data visually as well as the text underneath it. Um, and I don't know, I've now got this, colleagues at the economist. This, do you agree? I mean, I mean yeah. one of the things I found at AMT is the the conversational style is very is very powerful. Just yeah. I'll tend to talk to a colleague and say this is a story, you know, it's, it's saying this, I think it's about like this, but actually this person says that. That is actually how I tend to write the article. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. If you go back to, um, gosh, it's really just show how old I am, two key, exploratory data analysis, um, which was one of the great classics. I wouldn't recommend reading it now. It feels terribly dated, but he used to do the whole lot with graph paper and slide rules. Um, but his point was that um, is, is a lot of it is about the visual faculty. I mean, you know, point, your point, you can, you can spin a graph around very easily now. And we do, we can absorb huge amounts of information from a graphic far faster, and we can observe patterns and so on. Tukey made the point that there's a difference between exploratory data analysis and assertive data analysis. So you can explore a chart. Almost the first thing I do when I get a large batch of data is I chart it. I just block out the columns I'm interested in and I put them whatever it seems to me the appropriate chart. And I look at it. And that's about it, really. And then you can, because you can explore, you can pick out patterns that aren't immediately apparent in columns of data and so on. But the, once you start firing them around as proof, I think you're playing a slightly different game. But it remains true that they are the best way of condensing large amounts of data visually. Another point, another point about the, the kind of visual representation is, is, is the prospect for animation yeah. and um, mm. making the, the visual presentation very beautiful. And these are, these are good things. They make it compelling. They make it exciting to people who I think would have otherwise found it rather dull, you know, black and white bar charts. And now the, the things move, you know, in big bubbles and Hans Rosling gets very excited on stage in 3D. Um, uh, but as, uh, as my, my friend... Tim Harford says, uh, you know, misinformation can be beautiful too. Mm. <laughs> so one of the... Um, sorry, can, we can, I, can, I, can we go yeah. for another question at the back? Hello, I'm Jenny Russell. <laughs> I'm, I'm a columnist at The Times. Um, I'm interested that you say in the front that you think that all journalists now are data journalists. I wish that was true. Most journalists <laughs> haven't a bloody clue about <laughs> numbers and therefore completely misserve the public. Um, and there are a couple of recent examples. One was something on the Today programme about 18 months ago where they reported very solemnly that um, with every alcoholic drink you took, a woman increased her risk of breast cancer by 4%. They went on saying that all through the programme. <laughs> Nobody ever stopped to work out how that so was So about eight drinks impossible. in, you're pretty much you're dead. dead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And um, the second point was an article in The Guardian this week by somebody who was writing about Benefit Street. And he said, uh, this is not the benefit street that I know, because I went and surveyed it for my company. And we got a 70% response rate, and we only found that 40% of the population were on benefits. There were then about 150 comments in which everybody took the fact that 40% of 70% was the same as 40% of 100%. Instead of seeing that the other 30% could all have been on benefits, in which case the unemployment rate would have been nearly 60%. And not a single commenter pick that up. So I think you've got a fantastic responsibility in a way to recognise that the rest of the world simply doesn't understand numbers and that people can be totally deceived by statistics. And mm. In a way, I'd like to know what you're going to do to educate the rest of the journalistic profession in how to use data. Shame. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is, I think, the problem with, with having newspapers employ data journalists. Mm. It lets everybody else off. Um, yeah. You know, and that includes publications which are quite good at this, like like The Guardian. You know, The Guardian has this wonderful data blog and it has a lot of wonderful data journalists. Um, but it also has a lot of journalists who aren't data journalists and they wouldn't think of themselves that way. They wouldn't think of data all that much and, and does publish stories that don't really fit. And, and other publications are, you know, sort of the same. I mean, I, the lobby, I, I have huge problems with the lobby generally, but the lobby is the worst at this. I'm publishing sort of data that they're given by special advisors. And the number of stor political stories you see that say, you know, data freshly released from DWP, and of course it's not data freshly released. It's data that was released officially six months ago, and a special advisor has gone through it and picked up the kind of story that helps tell the government's role and said, we're releasing data, here it is. Um, and, and the lobby reporter's gone and, re and just <laughs> reported it straight. That really annoys me. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's a sort of way of spreading it. We've got to kind of 
I don't know. It's every day a journalist should be a data journalist rather than every day a journalist is. Well, I think as well it comes from why the journalists are there to begin with and who hired them and where they're sitting. So the data journalists at the Times Sunday Times, we sit in the newsroom away from the rest of our team. And part of our reasons for being there is to educate the newsroom. So we gave talks and made sure certain people were invited. And I was quite new, but I was told, oh, this person, he was on his phone. He's an investigative journalist, very old school, wasn't interested. But when you started telling about FOIing and FOIing for data and how you can glean stuff off databases that aren't released to the public, they, he was like, this guy got really interested. And then now he comes and asks me whenever he FOIs for data, how should I do it? Partly as well, whenever we get a request, if the request is poorly made, we talk to them, we talk, go face to face, talk to them, Produce something for them such that we have a win. Don't just kind of say, oh, you're being ridiculous. You can't do that. We do something, but tell them how they can do it better with you next time. Make it not about data. Make it about communication. Make it about, we're not researchers, but you need to tell us the story. You need to get us on the point of commission. Because we can add things to you, and you can get more out of it. That won't be a big data spread. It might not be a table, but we'll en you'll end up actually getting more and being able to glean more from it. And that works quite well. I disagree with Dan to this extent. Having data journalists is a lot better than not having yeah. data journalists. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's fair. And you know, because the the, the alternative, what well, you know, I mean, a story was one person in the old yeah. days. Data was two people. Yeah. You know, you, you got it confirmed by somebody else down yeah, the path. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, we're we're making. Well, I do think we're a bit better than that. Well, <laughs> right? I mean, one of the things, and, is it's, and quite often because you you do have sometimes in the same paper. You know, from the same publication. You know, you'll get Mark Easton doing a story as Home Affairs editor, crunching the stuff. While elsewhere in the BBC, you'll have some prime bollocks. You know, and the the kind of the the kind of embarrassment. You know, that's gonna. I think Jenny, that will sink in in the end. You know, people won't be able to get away with the rubbish quite so easily. Can we? Sorry, can we just get one? Someone else who hasn't asked a question. Three questions at once. Okay. We got three questions. Someone has the mic. Hi, uh, my name is Josh. Um, I was just uh, wondering, um, it seems to me from stuff that friends of mine post on Facebook and so on, um, especially things put out by political parties or stuff from general kind of online rumour mills, people seem to interrogate data less than they would interrogate maybe written out information. They tend to just take data that they're given and think, oh, it's facts, it's stats, it must be true, and repost it while interrogating it less. So while the stuff that you guys do... Um, you can get very far in terms of interrogating these data sets. For most people, data can actually be used to mislead them more than uh, the old-style information, the written-out stuff. I was wondering how you think we can kind of get over that, how we can combat that. Any, any other questions? Down here at the front again. We'll get to you in a second. Hi, I'm Beth. I work for the Associated Press. Um, at the beginning of the panel, you were talking about um, data integrity and trusting sources. I was wondering how that factors into when you use a third party to do your programming, mechanical Turk or an API, how does that affect your kind of editorial thinking about how that affects the process the data goes through? Hi, um, I'm Izzy. I work at the FT at the moment. Um, it's weird, the first time I ever stepped in this room was when WikiLeaks was publishing all its stuff. And I was just wondering, do you think that was the first time that data journalism first crept onto people's journalistic horizons, or do you think it was before then? So we've got three questions. One question is um, about do people uh, take data at face value more than the written words? And the second question was, God, um, you were asking, can you, can you say it again? Um, Mediated. Me the using third parties. Using third parties. Yeah. And the third is about WikiLeaks and the impact of big <laughs> things like MPs' expenses. Who wants yeah. to take? So like the first two, I can answer in the militant way I do. I refuse to use a third party. I also refuse to use paid for software. I use everything that's open source. I only use open source. Um, when I do something, I will, I will release the code. I will put it on GitHub. I will open source it. I also work off virtual machines. So instead of saying, this is something you can run only if you have a PC running on Windows, blah, 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 I will give the complete environment. And it is completely reproducible from scratch. And that's just me being incredibly militant. I will not use Mechanical Turk. I will not use third parties. I, cannot, I will not use something that cannot be reproduced in court on the day that it is necessary. And we also work with a statistician. So we don't even trust third parties doing that. I will sit down. I can check his work. He can check mine. 
we have but developers. Is, you still have to be realistic. You're saying that yeah. you're checking each other, and actually, a lot of your readers won't use GitHub. So you showing your work, yeah. like you have to show your workings in the article itself and in the body, and saying, you know, we multiplied yeah. this by this, and you and if you can't translate it to readers, yeah. then no matter how open source that is, you so it's still I not. Don't know what we do what we do is there's a blog post, and it's a yeah. traditional thing that kind of ProPublica did. Is yeah. there is this story, and then there's there's the how we did it for people interested how we did it. I didn't think people would be interested in reading that, yeah. but when I did it for The Guardian, I got a lot of comments from it, and the yeah. first comment was, thank you for not doing a half-assed job. It's incredible to see. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is, yes, it's not available for the vast majority of people, but a lot of journalists, people who tinker with computers, can and do take I'm it up. I'm not saying it's not necessary. Yeah. I'm saying it's not sufficient. That in itself is not enough to, to make things accessible yeah. for readers. It's not necessarily making things accessible. It's saying, I am going to produce all my workings in the open. It's the same thing if you're not doing data journalism, but you release all the recordings of your interviews, all your shorthand notes. You will make a mistake. You'll always make a mistake as a journalist, but they can't show that it's anything malicious or you haven't done your job. Just like in traditional investigative journalism, what you need to stand up in court is your recording and all your paperwork. And it's not to say that you won't do anything wrong, it's to say that I'm going to do everything in the open. What, what do you do if your, um, your software is proprietary and you're making predictions and, uh, and you're Nate Silver? <laughs> and your yeah. algorithms you don't really want to tell everybody about, and you, you know, because that's the way yeah. he works. Actually, I don't mind because he stands or fall on the basis yeah. of his predictions. So <laughs> I, you know, I, you know, but no, he won't tell you his algorithms. And oh, you better yeah. won't. <laughs> I won't make you speak for Nate Silver. Okay. I wouldn't actually. Mind. Um, I can I just? So you mentioned Hans Rosling. I think that's kind of one of the, he's one of the key people who talks about kind of uh, ignorance about data and and this and and one of the questions was about kind of benefits and how people think they're much worse than they are and how. Uh, yeah, it's in, peak it's child means that we're not going to have uh, massive population growth in 100 billion people. Yes. What, you know, what, how, how do we answer that question about um, I don't, solving data I don't think data I agree agreements? that um, people have an innate tendency to trust them more mm. because th th we're just very ambivalent. Mm. I mean, on the one hand, you know, there's a traditional kind of journalistic killer fact. You know the kind of thing I mean, you know, you bung it in the headlines, it's kind of up 40%, you think, you whoa, yes, and that's all I need, and there's a kind of sexual charge about that. But on the other hand, there's... Speak for yourself. <laughs> on the other hand, there's, there's lies, damned lies, and statistics. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's absolutely as much cynicism as there is kind of credulousness, mm -hmm. sometimes in the same people. You know, and, and journalists are wonderful because we can do both at the same time simultaneously. You know, we can do it simultaneously. We can believe that it's rubbish I, and think it's a killer fact. You know. um, so I'm, I'm not sure that I buy the idea that there is an innate bias to believe. I think there's, a, there's an interesting point about how we treat... When people try and manipulate statistics to us, we sort of go, yeah, fine. Um, and maybe we, we don't kind of repeat them straight. Uh, maybe we do. Um, but... You know, when a politician sort of goes and lies straight about something factual, then it's a huge scandal. Um, mm. But when a politician goes and says something that's basically untrue, based on sort of like clearly manipulated statistics, well, at best somebody, you know, Andrew Dillnot writes a letter, and the Guardian gets a little huffy, and the FT and we don't report it, um, <laughs> and that's about it. Uh, yeah, that's just sort of the sum total of it. And like, there's, there's something in our political journalistic culture which treats a sort of a straight lie about something very straight factually as enormously scandalous, whereas we're not concerned about sort of data. You know, we, we think that politicians sort of have a right to say what they like. And, yeah. I ask, ask... Um, I, is there any more questions? Ask Ian Duncan Smith if he shares that. The view that <laughs> he's, We've got to follow he's up here got away to the, with it um, clean. I, I'm not well, sure not quite clean, could, but I I'm don't know sure if he's... Can, I just, can we just uh, ask, ask a, there's a follow-up question here? Yeah. Hi, my name's Jack, I'm from City Uni. Um, coming back to what Michael was saying about confirmation bias, surely the basis for any good data story is researching something and something which is in the spotlight, surely you're going to have prior expectations to that story. So how, how do you actually well, avoid this confirmation not, bias? Not always, because sometimes the expectations are generated by somebody else's claim or hypothesis, and you're simply testing it. So it's not always true that you generate the hypothesis. Uh, you know, and quite, often, quite a lot of journalism is like that. We're taking other people's data which is often attached to some sort of political claim or think tank claim or whatever. And we're just going out there and saying, I wonder if this is true. Is there any I wonder if for what basis there is in that. Now, you, now, I'm not hostile to the idea sometimes of going 
to try and test a proposition, you know, even if it's your own, uh, you have to start somewhere. The, so the key thing for me is being aware of the disposition that we all have to try and find confirmation of things that we already think are true. Because as soon as that process starts, you know, you, we're all in trouble. And it's very, very difficult to get out of. I'm not, I'm not saying there's a kind of pure psychological state in which anyone can really uh, remove all traces of any sort of influence before they try and find out anything. I don't think that's quite true. But we need to be aware that we have a tendency to do this sort of thing. And, and I think one of, the, one of the effects of working with data for a long time is that either it makes a complete mischief monster out of you, you know, where you'll use it to say anything that's convenient, or I think you do tend to develop this kind of strange determination <laughs> to get to the bottom of whatever, whatever it is. I, don't, I mean, I don't know how yeah. people feel about this. Yeah. Yeah. There's a sort of independence. You yeah. feel fiercely yeah. independent yeah. when you start... Yeah. You start yeah. doing data. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mona, you, yeah, yeah, of yeah. Course, yeah. I mean, possibly every journalist would say yeah. that, you know. That, but but I, I, <laughs> you do begin the, checking everything. You do including check everything everybody else. else's work. And, uh, um. and it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the can, I, can I just? We've got we've got three or four more minutes. So I'm just going to ask everyone if you could say. So a student journalist is probably going to come up to you at the end of this event and ask you three things. Ask you what 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 they can do to kind of get into this field. Um, and I'm just going to ask you what would you say to that person. Um, so starting with Mona. Yeah. Okay, um, an instinct to um, not merely describe but also analyse why, um, to not be afraid of um, being able to master different things. So you can't just be a good writer. You can't just be familiar with spreadsheets. You need to know the basics of coding. You need to know, you need to know several different <laughs> tools. <laughs> Do you not think? No. No. Okay. You need somebody um, who knows. Um, you need somebody who knows. And like, this is a trait that any journalist needs. But just to not be arrogant because it's just such a massive risk. And to be open to listening to readers and not just checking other people, but checking yourself. So writing up an article and then coming back to it a week later and, and asking, was that definitely, definitely true? Excellent. And Dan, um, you disagree a little bit? No, I don't really. I, I, I'm not sure. I think I would, I would love if I knew more coding, but I don't know how far you have to push, I think. Um, so what, what would you say? I would say that a, you know, for, for somebody trying to get into journalism or interested in political journalism or whatever, like a fairly simple the thing that will data. give you a benefit over 95% of British journalists is learn to use the ONS website. Um, because That's a tall order, I can say. <laughs> <laughs> you can learn where to find statistics quickly and how to, um, you know, how to, to sort of pick a statistic that's valid and, and uh, to either debunk or, or prove a story, then that will get you very, very far. Um, but, yeah. I, I would say the most important thing is do not feel you need to be taught something to be able to do it. Do not rely on anything else. I'm completely self-taught in programming. Google it. There are so many free resources you can do anytime you want. Absolutely anything. Do not expect someone else to teach it to you or tell you you should do it. Anything else? Don't be seduced by the glamorous, exciting, flashy stuff. Remember that you can produce rubbish very easily and seductively with all those techniques. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you can scrape data and produce rubbish. You can all the tricks can be put to bad ends if you do not have the skills of statistical inference, inference rather, to make sure that you're saying something legitimate. Yeah. All the rest is rubbish. Yeah. On that exciting note, exciting rubbish. <laughs> Exciting rubbish. Exciting but rubbish. Still rubbish. But it's still rubbish. Of course, there are courses. Um, yes, yeah. and there are courses. Are there any dying yeah. Yeah. questions? Um, okay, go on. Okay, yeah, you've already had one. Yeah, I'm going to wrap you up. You can ask them after. Fine. Guys, just to say uh, thank you, first of all, to our panel. That was brilliant. Um, and we've got about 20, 25 minutes now for everyone to get some food. There'll be some cannabis going around. It's not supper, but it's something. Uh, and there is a free bar up to a point, so please do take a point. <laughs> <laughs> From both floors. And then we'll come back to the main panel. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for our speakers.